I know that self-matching your adoption or matching without an agency can sometimes be a little confusing or just feel a little discouraging. So today I wanted to share with you a success story from Jessica S. She's going to share with us how she self-matched her adoption. In case we haven't met yet, my name is Amanda, and I'm an adoptive mom of two on a mission to make your adoption easier, faster, and more affordable. I release new videos like this each and every week, so make sure you subscribe and click the bell icon so that you're notified each and every time I release a new video. In today's conversation, we have the pleasure of speaking with Jessica S. Jessica is going to share how she self-matched her adoption, and I think there's some really actionable tips that we can all take away from today's conversation. So let's dive right in, shall we? Well, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome back to the My Adoption Coach YouTube and podcast. We have a special guest joining us today, Jessica S. Jessica is an adoptive mom through self-matching, and she's going to share a little bit more about her journey with us. Jessica, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story with the community. We all know that self-matching your adoption can be a little tricky and be a little frustrating at times. And I think seeing just examples of people that have been successful in their journeys definitely helps us keep strong in our own journeys. So thank you so much. No problem. Um, So if um, based on our conversation, I know that you have two children that you've self-matched your adoptions through. Can you tell us a little bit more about your adoption journey? Yep, absolutely. Um, So my husband and I uh, started our journey back in 2014. Um, We were initially living in Delaware, which is an agency only state. So we did um, start out with an agency, but after about 18 months, um, we realized that we were probably not going to be matching through the agency. Um, And we ended up moving back home to North Carolina, which is a um, state that's kind of more acceptable to do private matching. So my sister uh, actually suggested to us to create a Facebook page. And she's like, you know, everybody has information out on Facebook these days. Have you thought about it? And so we researched it and we kind of were a lot of trial and error put in to Mm -hmm. see like, you know, what would work and what wasn't going to work and the ethics behind it. Um, and we ended up creating a, uh, adoption page and we had some pictures taken and boosted a post and, um, we're really consistent with that and ended up matching with our daughter's first mom. Um, and that she was born in 2016. And then when we decided to adopt again, we went back and used our platform, um, and we were very blessed to have a lot of followers continue with our page. And um, so we already had a large kind of following for our second adoption journey. And our son was born in 2018. Wow. So talk to me a little bit more about your followers. I know this is a question we get quite a lot in our community on how do you share it? You know, where do you share it? What are your best tips in that space? Um, That's a great question. So we were very open with our families and our friends and our community that we were hoping to adopt. And so we really asked our families and friends on Facebook to share. Um, Anytime we would post something, you know, we would ask them, hey, do you mind sharing? Um, And they did a really great job of kind of branching out and ended up sharing all throughout the U.S. We had family members who actually lived overseas and they were sharing in Germany. So it was kind of funny um, to see it everywhere. But um, sharing on different Facebook groups that you can share your information on as well. Um, And then, like I said, we paid to promote our page and we also paid to boost a post. And then whoever liked our post, we went back in and invited them to like our page. So we were kind of, you know, relying on our friends and family initially to get the word out. And then we were also relying on uh, promoting our page through Facebook. 
So talk to me a little bit more about promoting your page through Facebook. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that one of the questions that I often struggle with, even from like a corporate day job and marketing perspective is making sure that your message is getting to the right audience. How Mm -hmm. were you able to really do that through boosting your post? Yeah. So it can be kind of hard to find that niche. Um, and I hate that it comes across as like businessy, but it is kind of, um, I mean, you're in the business of selling yourself and you want to be real and authentic and, you know, to find the audience that's going to connect most with you. And that was a lot of trial and error initially. Um, but we kind of would put interest in, Um, And we were open to traveling throughout the U.S. So every state that was um, you were allowed to advertise in and that was, I guess, quote unquote, adoption friendly, meaning that it wasn't like a 30 day um, termination of parental rights, you know, something that we wouldn't have to stay a month or two months or six months in um, as far as traveling for adoption. Um, We selected every state that we could. Um, We focused on women from the ages of 18 to 38 um, because that's kind of the audience that we were looking towards as far as people who might be expecting and also friends or family that would know of expecting mothers who were thinking about adoption. Um, And then also just the interest, we kind of played around a lot with the interest um, section and we put in things that were important to us um, that we thought might resonate with an expectant mom. Um, We also put in like pro-life, pregnancy and adoption, open adoption, family attorney, you know, just things that were keywords that if somebody who is thinking about adoption might use Facebook to look through. That totally makes sense. That's Mm -hmm. awesome. Um, When we were prepping for the interview, you also mentioned about just kind of the differences in openness with your adoptions between both Mm -hmm. of your children. Do you mind to touch upon that as well? Sure. So um, both of our children um, have siblings that are parented um, by their first moms. And our daughter's family is very open. Um, The siblings know about her. We see them. Um, Like I said, we live in North Carolina. She was born in Arizona. Um, So we go to Arizona every year. Um, We do in-person visits. We're friends on social media. So they're very much involved, uh, you know, to the extent that's allowed on social media and, you know, (laughs) being five and living in North Carolina and the other family living in Arizona. um, We're very open. You know, we do video chats. They send pictures back and forth. So we try to have that connection um, with her first family. And then my son is also, you know, has siblings that are parented, but they do not know about him. Um, so that is kind of the level of openness we're at where we see his first mom and her husband. Um, but we don't have that relationship with the siblings yet. And I'm hoping eventually we will be able to get there. Um, but you know, that's, that's a personal choice that his first mom has to make and it affects a lot of people. So, you know, we're always open to it. The door is always open. So, yeah. As you connected with each of your expectant mamas at the time, Mm -hmm. how did those conversations really unfold? Did you have conversations as it relates to your, you know, expectations for contact after birth and all of that? Mm -hmm, Absolutely. So it's kind of like, I tell people it's kind of like dating. (laughs) You kind of, um, you, you throw questions out there and you just kind of see how they react. And we were very, very blessed that both of our, um, kids, first moms were very communicative. Um, you know, they both reached out and later in their pregnancies. Um, so we had a lot to talk about very quickly to kind of see if it was going to be a good fit for both of us. Um, and yeah, we both talked about, um, you know, what we would ideally like as far as open, uh, relationships. And I think, you know, it's really hard, uh, initially because they don't know how they're going to feel 
you know, after placing. Yeah. Um, and it, it might take a little bit of time for that relationship to develop, um, you know, because I think they are trying to give you space to figure out how to parent and you don't want to mm -hmm. overwhelm them emotionally with, you know, sending pictures and stuff like that. But I will always say, you know, just be open and honest and, you know, to, to keep your word. If you promise something, make sure that you're going to be able to follow up on that. Um, because it is a lifelong relationship you're establishing. So, yeah. you know, and, and it can change, you know, it can definitely change. They yeah. might become more and more open, you know? And so it, it's really, it's like dating and it's like, um, it's unique, very unique situations, <laughs> but the better, the better, um, communication you can have, the easier the relationships are. Agreed. Yeah. I often tell people that it's really important to have a clear vision of what you want life to be like at the end of the journey. Yeah. And also where you're flexible too, because yeah. you don't want to end up in a situation where you're not a good fit, obviously. Right. Um, and to your point, it's so critical that you keep your word at the end of the, the journey, so to speak, yeah. at the end of the finalization period. Like that's just to me, the start of mm -hmm. the conversation. Absolutely. As, yeah, for sure. And so it's really yeah. important. Um, and there are uh, tons of creative ways to your point that you can do that in a way that makes the first family and your family feel comfortable and safe in yeah. order to having those conversations. Yeah, um, definitely. That is amazing. Um, so you talked a little bit about finding your, you know, expectant mamas through Facebook, particularly. Mm -hmm. I know another issue that we often face in our community is around adoption scams. And I know mm -hmm. you're really passionate about this and have a Facebook group as well. So can you share a little bit about the audience or with the audience about that? Absolutely. Um, so it is a big part of people's concerns when they are thinking about um, connecting on social media um, is what to do with scamming. And unfortunately it happens. Um, there are people out there who just target um, specifically target hopeful mm -hmm. adoptive families. Um, and, you know, we, I do have a Facebook group um, ending adoption scams, which we try to, you know, put people's information out there, you know, in a respectful way, mm -hmm. just to see if anybody else is talking to this person. Is it, you know, a legitimate situation? Um, and so I, I have, seen a lot of positive reviews that it is a service that, you know, people appreciate and mm -hmm. we're able to kind of protect each other. Um, but yeah, there are, there are people out there that will unfortunately try to take advantage, whether it's financially or emotionally. Um, and there are some very popular people out there that have been making the rounds for quite a few years. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, but, you know, it is as long as you kind of can tell the red flags and you're working with an adoption professional, whether it's like consultant or uh, attorney, you know, um, bouncing these things off of them as well. Um, they are a great resource for also trying to vet people. Um, so, yeah, that's great. Would you mind if we link to that in the show notes? Sure, so that everybody absolutely. Can... Great. Yeah, Thank you so absolutely. much. You're welcome. You talked a little bit about adoption professionals. Can you tell us a little bit about what that looks like in your journey? You already mentioned that agency wasn't the route for you, but what right. was your journey like from an adoption professional side? When did you bring them in? Who did you work with? Not specifically the person, but, you know, generalities. Right. Yes. So we initially did work with an agency. It's a national agency. Um, and they're based out of California. Um, but we did not have a good experience and saw a lot of red flags. Um, so we quickly decided that, you know, once our contract was done, we would not be renewing. And uh, that was not somebody that we would suggest to other families who asked us. Um, so we our daughter is Native American and Hispanic. So we have experience with the ICWA um, situation a little bit. Very fortunately, we were not, you know, drug into a lot of um, things based on tribal laws and um, mm. 
a recommendation for a good ICWA attorney. So we were working with somebody based out of Arizona, and then he represented our daughter's first mom. And then we had an attorney here in North Carolina who was working with us to do the finalization. Um, so we quickly knew that we had to get somebody involved. Um, our daughter's first mom was contacted us the end of August and was due September 21st. So it was very quick. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So we had to get the ball rolling pretty quickly on trying to find services and people to put in place for her, Mm -hmm. um, as well as find an adoption attorney in North Carolina locally that would be facilitating the finalization. Um, With our son, we knew we were not going to have a consultant or agency involved. um, And so we kind of just waited to see, you know, who would reach out and where they would be reaching out from, you know, if it was somebody local in North Carolina, we would use the same, um, the same attorney who finalized our sons, uh, our daughters. And then uh, our son's mom is in South Carolina. So uh, we found an attorney in South Carolina who was able to work with her and a social worker as well. Um, and she was about 34 weeks pregnant when she reached out. So again, you know, not a lot of time, but, you know, we had a lot of initial conversations, um, with her. And then when she decided that we would be a good fit, um, we got some information together for her and she started just the information gathering process through the attorney and social worker. Um, so I would say once you kind of have some conversations and you both feel like it would be a good fit, that would be the time to kind of start the process with Mm -hmm. your attorney um, so that they can get information that they need to start the process on their end. You know, and of course, none of it is 100 percent ironclad. It can always change. But, Mm -hmm. you know, I would think, you know, just the initial process getting started is always kind of a, a good, solid next step. Yeah, I agree with that. You touched on two things there that I think are really important. One, you each having your own attorney, yeah. um, because I do think that that, as you stated earlier, being truly ethical in the process, um, This everybody has their own preferences here, but my preference yeah. is that you each have your own attorney because therefore each attorney is, even if you're paying for the attorney for both sides, right. each attorney is duty bound to that particular client. Exactly. Um, and that was really important. And then not forgetting the the services and the support that the first mama needs in her journey. Cause yeah. she has a journey ahead, not only just from a, you know, bearing the child and all of that, but the emotional side and processing through all of that, that's, that's a lot. And it when is. I coach people through replicating the agency model without, you know, the expense of the agency model, I'm always trying to help people find resources for mm-hmm. how, you know, do you find a social worker? Do you find a grief counselor? Do you find an adoption mm-hmm. counselor? Like what's the right thing for your situation? Yeah. Um, but I think that's one of the elements elements is often overlooked in the self-matching journey is ensuring that there's support there. Yes. And I think that's where a lot of people kind of have a hard time with the self-matching, not coming from the hopeful adoptive adoptive parent, but the adoptee, adult adoptee and um, expectant mom or moms that have placed get a lot of, give a lot of feedback on just that there aren't a lot of resources given when you're self-placing. Um, so yeah, having resources, talking to your attorney to make sure they are putting resources in front of the expectant mom, um, you know, hiring a social worker, hiring a counselor, you know, just letting her know that, Hey, you know, if you ever need to go to therapy, let us know. I mean, we've talked to both of our kids, first moms and told them it doesn't matter if it's today, if it's a year from now, if it's 10 years from now, you know, if you get to a point where you want to talk to somebody or need somebody to talk to, let us know, you know, we'll help you financially. We'll pay for the visits um, because it is, I mean, it's a a life changing situation and it's not done when you walk out of the hospital, you know what I mean? It's something, (laughs) something that's going to be processed for the rest of your life. And I think it's just very important to realize that as an adoptive parent, 
the obligation that you have to making sure that their needs are met and not just the baby and not just yours. Agreed. Yeah. That is, is so really important. And I come across clients all the time that are like, you know, I'm just really struggling on the backside of my adoption on having a good relationship with my child's first family and what tips and nine times out of 10, the conversation starts with the, I feel like an ATM, right. Or yeah. they're, you know, she's only asking me for money and she's not asking me for updates as it relates to the child yeah, um, or, or things of that nature. And so that gets really uncomfortable um, sometimes. And the conversation typically stems back to there's grief that needs to be unpacked and processed within that. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So Jess, thank you so much for, for joining us today. I'd love to see if there are any other tips or best practices that you would like to share with our audience as, as an experienced um, self-matching mama. (laughs) Sure. So one of my biggest things would probably be staying consistent on your social media pages. Um, You do not have to post every single day, but I would say, you know, at least weekly being consistent. Um, And just make it fun. I know a lot of it can be daunting sometimes Mm -hmm. trying to figure out what to post and what, you know, where to post it. Um, So just trying to make it like a visual scrapbook, um, a day to day like life thing. You know, we would put things like silly things like what's your pet doing today, you know, or post your pet or, you know, um, do social media interaction posts like three have to go or which three are you going to keep coffee, leggings, books, you know, that type of thing. And those were really great posts to build interaction and to keep your page kind of flowing. Um, And then also if you're comfortable doing videos, you know, I think using the stories and video features on Facebook is wonderful, a wonderful resource. It really is. It really does make a difference. Um, my clients that are self-matching, whenever you do have video included in it, that is, mm-hmm. you know, those are the engagements that you see that really drive up your overall oh, yeah. page likes and your page impressions. And that yeah. actually are making your ads more efficient as well, for sure. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, for sure. Yeah. And don't give up hope. There's a lot, (laughs) there's a lot of people out there waiting and, you know, we've all been through it and I would just say, you know, try to stay positive. Your time is coming. I promise. (laughs) Right. It is. It is so hard to know, but it, I mean, just like in your case, it can go from, you know, no opportunity to parenting in less than a month. Right. Yes. Crazy. (laughs) Crazy. (laughs) It can happen fast. Uh, One last question. I would be amiss if I didn't ask. I know my audience would definitely want to know is how long from when you started sharing to when you actually, you know, got the first real reach out. Absolutely. Um, So we had a lot of initial uh, messages and things like that, just asking about surrogacy. Um, And then we'd had a few people who would reach out and just like, say a little few things and then kind of ghost. Um, but I would say really our first official like contact was about seven to eight weeks in of consistently boosting. And we picked one post. It had a self-explanatory picture. It was us like with a little map and it said on our adoption journey and a quick blurb about us. And we consistently boosted that one post. So it drove, excuse me, it drove our numbers up because it was one post. It had like 23,000 likes on it, like almost a thousand shares. So that was what we, like our strategy was. Um, And then I would say it was about nine weeks after we did our first boost that our daughter's first mom reached out and it was pretty much the same with our son, I would say between eight and 12 weeks. So fairly quick. And I have seen people that, you know, I've been talking to who are doing the same thing anywhere from four weeks to about eight months. I mean, it just really depends. It's kind of hard to say, you know, what that one thing is that connects you to Mm -hmm. an expectant mom. Um, 
but it varies. But I would say the sweet spot is generally about three to four months in. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's very similar to what I'm seeing with my clients. It just kind of depends upon the creative and the creative really landing with the right, the the post, which is the creative really landing with the right audience, right? Yes, absolutely. Getting the right message out there. Well, thank you again so much for joining us today. We'll definitely link in the show notes to the adoption scam, ending adoption scams group so that people can, can find uh, you there and, and share and learn a little bit more about you from that. Absolutely. Thank you so much again for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good one. You too. All right, friends. Well, I hope you found today's episode really valuable. I think it is great to hear directly from someone who has self-matched herself and used Facebook and Instagram in order to really accomplish her goal. Specifically, she focused on Facebook and boosting that post. And if you want to learn more about really kind of the keys to success in self-matching your adoption through social media, make sure that you check out my free training at myadoptioncoach.com backslash social media training. In that training, I'm going to walk you through how you create an emotional connection through your profile that you share on social media and give you all the tips to be successful with self-matching your adoption in 2022. And if you're self-matching your adoption, make sure you check out these other videos or the other podcast within the podcast player that you're listening through so that you can get all the best tips on how to have a successful self-matching adoption. And again, friend, remember anything's possible with the right plan and support. And I've always got your back with the step-by-step process and the support you need along your journey. I'll talk to you soon, friend.